Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media for our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good evening to those like me here on the East Coast and in the US. Uh, my name is Greg Poling. I direct the Southeast Asia Program and the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative at CSIS in Washington. And I am really thrilled to be kicking off the third part of our three-part webinar series on Oceans of Opportunity, which is being co-hosted by CSIS and the University of the Philippines Institute for Maritime Law uh, and uh, funded by the US Embassy in the Philippines. So as a reminder, everything you hear today is going to be on the record. Uh, for those who have hung in through the first two uh, sessions, welcome back. You know how this is going to work. For those who are new, thank you for joining us. You missed some great panels on fisheries and international law, maritime domain awareness, and plastics pollution. I recommend that you go back and look at the videos, all of which are up on CSIS.org and YouTube, uh, as this one will be as well. When we get to the Q&A after each of our panels, I'm going to ask the audience to go ahead and ask any questions in the Q&A function in Zoom. When you do so, please identify your name and your institution so that the moderators, when we pull those out of the queue, will know who the, the respondents are gonna be speaking to. And uh, with that, let me step aside and introduce my partner in this uh, conference, Jay Bato McCall with UP to introduce our keynoter, Jay. Hello and good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. And thank you for uh, sticking up with us for the past uh, three days. It's really a good, uh, a good conference so far, and we're on our last day. Our next speaker is the Environment Officer of the USAID here in the Philippines. He has been a uh, very well versed uh, in, in development work, especially in agriculture, with extensive experience in Africa and now in Southeast Asia. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome uh, Mr. John Edgar. Yes, thank you, Jay. Um, good, me good evening and good morning to everyone participating. It is my pleasure uh, to welcome you today to the third and final session of the Oceans of Opportunity uh, virtual conference and webinar series. The U.S. Embassy in Manila is very pleased to sponsor this month-long forum of discussions with experts from the United States, globally, and the Philippines to advance partnerships and programs to protect and advocate for our seas and oceans. On behalf of the USAID Philippines mission, we have found uh, the first two sessions highly relevant to our work and engagement in the Philippines, given our, ro given our robust programming in the fishery sector, as well as our work combating the growing challenge of marine litter. I would like to thank and acknowledge our distinguished speakers for our two panels today. Uh, panel five will discuss adapting to climate change. So we're very pleased to have Dr. Laura David, Director of the Marine Science Institute of the University of Philippines. Uh, Georgine Primavera, Chief Mangrove Scientific Advisor, uh, Zoological Society of London. Whitley Somweber, Director of the Stevenson's Ocean Secur Security Project at CSIS and of course moderated by Greg Poling, Senior Fellow and Director of the Asia Maritime Transparency um, Initiative at CSIS. Uh, the second panel, uh, panel six, will focus on regional cooperation and uh, John McManus of the University of Miami and Amanda Shao of the uh, International Crisis Group will speak and that will be moderated uh, by Jay uh, Baton Bajo, a Director of the Institute of Marine, uh, Maritime Affairs and Law of the Sea at University of Philippines. Uh, thanks again to Greg and Jay uh, for all you work, all the work that you've done. Um, it's been very um, welcome and, and you've been very instrumental uh, in this event and the timely discussions. On behalf of the U.S. Embassy, again, thanks again to you both. Regarding today's topic, um, I think we all know the Philippines is a country that faces extreme climate risk, being one of the 10 most uh, climate vulnerable countries in the world, according to the 2020 World uh, Risk Index. It is estimated that 74% 74, 74 of the Philippines' 109 million people are at risk of climate change impacts. Climate change also affects the Philippines' rich and globally significant biodiversity resources, exacerbating impacts of non-climate stresses, uh, stresses such as urbanization and environmental degradation. These impacts severely affect marine ecosystems of the country as well, further stressing the health of fish stocks, 
livelihoods of fisher folk and the country's overall food security. Global models project that climate change will result in a decline of between 9 to 24 percent of potential marine fisheries yield within the Philippines EEZ by 2050. The range of estimates varies depending on the rate at which future global greenhouse gas emissions are reduced. To better understand these impacts, we at USAID Philippines supported a study entitled Projected Climate Change Im Impacts on Philippine Marine Fish Distributions. This undertaking evaluated how fish habitat could be affected by ongoing and intensifying climate change, including the potential for local extinctions or reduction in abundance. This study further demonstrated the risk and challenges ahead as the 58 top commercial marine species uh, examined are estimated to experience reductions in suitability of existing habitats, which are, estimate, which are essential for growth and survival. Through our fishery project, USAID supports the Department of Agriculture's National Fisheries Research and Development Institute to use this information to ensure monitoring of climate sensitive species and to pre prepare adaptive management actions. Climate change impacts on fisheries also have socioeconomic impacts on coastal communities. To address these, USAID supports local governments in undertaking assessments on community vulnerabilities and their capacity to adapt to climate vulnerability. USAID also understands the importance of coastal ecosystems to the health of Philippines fisheries as we support mangrove restoration efforts. This intervention also provides uh, potential co-benefits -ben related to climate mitigation. As we all know, this is a big year for climate action. Under the Biden administration, climate is at, is at the forefront of our multilateral as well as bilateral engagements. The April Climate Leaders Summit hosted by President Biden highlighted the United States leadership on the climate crisis. President Biden announced a target of achieving a 50 to 52% reduction from, 20, from 2005 levels in the United States net greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Here in the Philippines, uh, the INDC was also updated and the country has committed to a 75% reduction in their business as usual greenhouse gas emissions. The US government stands ready to support the government of the Philippines and stakeholders to implement this ambitious commitment. Relatedly, several important announcements regarding international assistance were made at the Climate Leaders Summit. President Biden unveiled the first ever U.S. International climate, climate Finance Plan, which will double the United States public international climate finance to developing countries annually to $5.7 billion, as well as tripling annual funding for climate adaptation by 2024. I should also note that USAID is in the process of developing an agency climate strategy, which will be launched at this year's COP26 uh, in Glasgow in November. Uh, at USA Philippines, we look forward to also launching a new climate change activity. Uh, this project will support rapidly urbanizing second secondary cities to better use climate information for planning, um, also increase access to climate finance, and promote nature-based solutions to build climate resilience. Uh, we're also going to be discussing regional partnership, and I really look forward to learning from that panel and getting some ideas. But I would like to share that uh, USAID has recently entered into a partnership with the Korean in, uh, International Cooperation Agency, or COICA, for increased collaboration on development programming in the Philippines. Um, and this includes fisheries, climate change adaptation, oceans plastic, uh, among other priorities. In closing, thank you again uh, for the opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, I very much look forward to the discussion and the insights uh, from our expert panel. Thank you, John. I really appreciate it. Uh, not only when the keynote or gives great remarks, but when they do part of my job, I introduce in the panel for me so I can uh, I can step aside that much quicker. So as John said, we're going to uh, turn to the issue of adapting to climate change for the first panel. We've got three much smarter uh, and more articulate speakers than me, so I want to get out of the way very quickly. Let's turn first to Dr. Laura David with uh, the Marine Science Institute at UP Diliman. Uh, Dr. David? Good morning, everyone. Um, let me take this opportunity to thank, thank CSIS for this invitation uh, to be able to share some of what we've been doing. 
So um, one of the main problems of countries such as the Philippines and other countries within the region is that we do not have um, we do not have models for future scenarios at resolutions that are small enough to actually have um, uh, in the same scale as our governance scale. And that makes it hard for local governments, for example, for the small townships to, to adapt, to make their adaptation plans. So instead, um, we can look at past um, patterns of changes in certain aspects. No? So for, for the ocean, we look at sea level rise, extreme heating events, increases in temperature, change in water budget, and extreme rainfall events. And if we do this uh, for different parts of the country, we can then see which specific uh, impact that certain regions will have to deal with. Uh, on the map, you will see these impacts as shown um, and overlaid on top of our coastal habitat. So overlaid on top of corals, mangroves, um, and seagrass covers. So if you have these, then we can help the local government to be able to predict um, possibilities of impact. So one is in their food availability and livelihood. There are a total of um, for uh, 1.6 million people that are directly working in the fishery sector. And we know that on the average, we have about 4.9 metric tons of uh, fish that we gather from our waters. Um, and we also know the amount of population that is mostly concentrated around the coastal area. And we can calculate the possible demand for food fish in these areas. Um, another uh, data set that we do have is the number of fisher folk per, per province. And we can also calculate the density of the fisher folk per water, uh, municipal water area. So if we analyze all of these data, we can then see that uh, specific areas are more vulnerable or at higher risk, actually, uh, such as the uh, autom autonomous region of uh, Muslim Mindanao in the south. Um, and a lot of the country, a lot of the townships that are in the southern part and eastern part of the Philippines. Um, and if we if we narrow it down to what specific habitats will be impacted, um, we know the sea level rise, for example, will uh, definitely impact our mangroves. Then you can also see what type of possible interventions you, you can put in place. So for areas that are uh, highly dense in fissures, with mangroves, um, a lot of mangroves related fishery, for example, and you know that sea level rise is going to hit that area, then supplemental livelihood, uh, appropriate alternative livelihood are already uh, much needed uh, intervention. So we can go through this for the, entire, for the entire Philippines and at the same time, take a look at the vulnerability of their of their uh, communities because they also live right next to the coastline and if you take a look at the map we see that the most number of people affected by the rising sea levels um you have the philippines is um uh, about 100 million people and 60 percent of us live near the coast so we're talking about 64 million people that can be affected by sea level rise so if you, again, use all of the data, uh, availability of population density, and, and uh, even you can even go down to a very small level, like a barangay or municipality level, then already you can identify areas that at the same time as they are vulnerable to food security and livelihood, they're also vulnerable to sea level rise. So again, the autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao uh, comes up the highest. Uh, a lot of the other regions in the southern area of the Philippines comes up quite high. Uh, there are certain areas um, even within the Manila Bay area like Bulacan, for example, that are also highlighted. So 
all of these are um, you, we can do at the level where the the local townships can then make use of that data to prepare themselves and adapt to what is projected to be ha to happen. Um, but in order to convince the people to actually do something about this, you need to um, target two specific stakeholders. One are the decision makers, and for and for a lot of uh, reasons, that uh, including sustainability, you have to put that in terms of uh, possible money or resources uh, that can be used. And then the other one is you have to target the next generation so that it they will be more willing to to do all the hard things in order to adapt to what's going to happen. So. Um, in order to convince the higher ups, uh, we also want to show that conservation of our natural resources, our coastal habitats, can actually be sustainable if we have uh, entered into partnerships. So, for carbon sequestration, for example, um, taking care of our mangroves and our seagrass, it, it clearly shows that aside from protecting our food security and our livelihood, it will also help sequester carbon or, or Keep the carbon that's already there sequestered, um, and you know you can do all the math. For example, in in the Philippines, we only have ten percent of what what our mangroves were originally. So uh, there's a lot we can grow back, give back. So if we compute the amount that we can plant, two point seven million hectares, you know, calculate the carbon that's stored in that, cal calculate the amount of carbon dioxide that is um, equivalent to, to plant, uh, when you plant all of those mangroves back, you end up with a huge number. You know? In this case, you have uh, 3 million thousand metric tons. So that's almost equivalent to the annual CO2 emissions of the European Union. So uh, there's a possibility of co-investing you know? um, of uh, a lot of those that are, are emitting and not being able to balance out their CO2 budget uh, by any sequestration within their area. They can co-invest in trop tropical countries and help them rehabilitate mangroves. So it will be a win-win situation. And then finally, um, what I was sharing before, you also have to, um, you have to engage the next generation, no? uh, especially the very young. Uh, the elementary school kids. So it's also very important to be able to develop science communication materials that will tell them what will happen or what they have, the different biodiversity in your area and how each of these react to possible climate changes. So a sea, in this cartoon, for example, a sea level rises, you see the soil getting saltier and the natural um, the adaptation of that habitat is that the next generation, the next saplings will try and grow on higher ground. But you know, if we limit their ability to, to move, their ability to adapt naturally uh, by putting in human um, structures right next to the mangrove areas, such as uh, highways and, and malls and all of that, then we limit their ability to naturally adapt. Uh, and that uh, will target specific sensitive um, species, so sensitive to salinity or sensitive to increase in sea level height. So what you'll end up with eventually is uh, nature won't be able to adapt and eventually they may die. You know? So uh, short graphics like this, uh, educational materials will actually help. So it will really be good if um, uh, science communicators, illustrators will partner with scientists to get the message. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I uh, am uh, thrown now. I'm, I'm heartbroken from that video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but staying on the topic of mangroves, which is a great introduction to our next speaker, Dr. Georgine Prubavera, who's uh, a world famous expert on the issue of mangroves. Uh, Georgine? Good morning to all. Um, 
Let me see. Okay. Of the many, uh, good morning to all, of the many uh, goods and services of mangroves, two in particular are important to climate resiliency, that's coastal protection and carbon capture. An archipelago, the Philippines has more than 7,600 islands with uh, 36,000 km of coastline, which are both a blessing, you know, so much beauty, but also a blight to the country with um, an average of 20 typhoons that come a year from the Pacific. And typhoons, cyclones, hurricanes, they're all storm events. And the Philippines has what, a third? 30% of all of these events get to our part of the world. Not only the frequency, but also the intensity, the upper graph, the reds are the most intense storms. And the Philippines is right there. We can see from Wikipedia that uh, even going back to 1800, uh, a storm caused 20,000 deaths. As we can see the upper lower left photo. Not only deaths, but also damage of here. It says 2 billion from Haiyan, but actually more recent statistics give up to 15 US billion dollars from Haiyan and up to 15,000, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> 15,000 deaths. So, a 2012 review paper by MacIvor said that the damage, <clears throat> I'm sorry, from waves and other uh, storm events can be reduced, absorbed, attenuated by both physical factors like uh, topography and also biological factors like vegetation, the trees, the height, the spacing, and so on, so that to reduce 60% of the energy from just regular waves, you need a 100 meter wide green belt of vegetation. And if you want to remove 99% of the energy, then you need a half a kilometer of green belt. So this can be seen by the tsunami of 2004, where a wave about six to seven meters above sea level passed through vegetation of almost 100 meters and ended up just over one meter height. You know? um, so uh, this has been shown time and again. So that if we look at coastal protection, that's one of the services of mangroves in this 2008 paper by Barbier. And on the y-axis, we see the value net present value in millions of US dollars. And on the x-axis, the area of mangroves remaining, we find that maximum net present value of $16 million is when eight square kilometers of 10 is retained. That's 80% of uh, the mangrove is retained and only 20% is converted to aquaculture. So interestingly enough, in 1983, in a mangrove monograph, Sanger et al, already just from the top of their head said that no more than 20% of a given mangrove should be converted to aquaculture. And that gives the four to one mangrove to pond ratio, which really we have been pushing. I've been pushing for the last maybe 10 years now for the country. We look at present, the Philippines has parity, one-to-one -one mangroves to ponds instead of the four-to-one. So obviously we need massive rehabilitation. But this is the classic way it has been done in 2012, Camarina Sur, one million mangroves and 7,000 volunteers there. Unfortunately, the natural flora is Avicenia marina, and these were 1 million rhizophora propagules, the wrong species. So expectedly, less than 2% survival after four years. And it's not just the wrong species, but also the site. Uh, this was another project with the right species, Avicenia marina, very nice after three weeks, but very dead because they had been planted here. Um, 50 meters from the shoreline. And if we look at the classic texts, this was 
below mean sea level. So wrong side, right species. Now, if we remember the definition of mangroves as intertidal, they are mostly 70% above mean sea level. They are emerged. But look at these planting projects, thousands of people. They have not finished planting, but already uh, the water has come up. So you can imagine what's going to happen to the mangroves. And here, um, photo ops really is, is the name of the game. And this was for Miss Earth. You can see very pretty girls. But before you think that it's all, you know, photo ops in the Philippines, mostly actually we have Fisher folk, uh, civil society and students that do planting, serious planting. So looking at hectares of mangroves in the country, we see a continuing decline to fish ponds until 2000 when there's a dramatic doubling to 240, 260,000 hectares. And this one I could trace to multi-million peso or dollar planting projects funded by uh, Japanese bank, Asian Development Bank, and all these uh, international institutions, which happened to be mostly on seagrass beds. Uh, by the way, this has not really been documented, but we see this all over the Philippines, uh, planting on seagrass beds. Uh, so unfortunate increase of mangroves. And this slide shows how it has been done, mostly seafront planting, but we also have the seagrass planting, and that's the third. But if we compare the three options, seafront is very popular because there is no, it's open access, there is no uh, conflict, and you have all the photo ops. Seagrass also because it's out of sight. Uh, people don't see what's happening there, that the seagrasses are being, uh, killed. It's really for me an ecological crime. And finally, abandoned ponds. That is really what the focus should be. All the millions of pesos and all the effort because that's where mangroves used to be uh, and turned into, that's where, yeah, turned into fish ponds. So now to the last topic, carbon capture of the many kinds of forests. I think some of you have seen this, it's mangroves. The graph on the lower left have very high stores of carbon there compared to your tropical rainforest, temperate boreal forests. But not all mangroves are equal because we have natural sites. Uh, this was a PhD thesis of Claire Duncan that gave, uh, this is an eco park, 350 megagrams of carbon per hectare. So please note that. But when you have plantations, which she compared both seafront and fish ponds, seafront carbon was not too high, but fish ponds that were being reverted back into mangroves gave what? Almost double, 650 megagrams carbon, almost double the natural size. This is really a very strong push for already implementing more than 10 years of uh, laws that mandate the reversion of abandoned ponds. And so finally, um, this is one of our project sites uh, of GSL. Over three years, this was a nine hectare abandoned pond. We had complete cover by planting available wild seedlings. It takes 15 to 20 years if you don't if you just let nature do its thing, that's too long. You know, every year you have 20 typhoons. So you have to help nature, have to assist. And in 2010, the then mayor who has passed away, by the way, with the yellow star, was so enthusiastic, so inspired that he made it an eco park. He declared it an eco park, just simple nipa and bamboo with a 200 meter green belt as mandated by law. And this year, after 11 years, his son, I think, or his grandson, who is now the mayor with a yellow star, inaugurated now an upscale uh, info center with concrete and uh, so on uh, to replace the Nipahat. So uh, these things, you know, are very uh, positive uh, examples of what local governments can do. Thank you. Thank you, Georgine. 
And finally, let me turn to my colleague, Witt Salmweber, uh, with the Stevenson Ocean Security Project here at CSIS. Witt? Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here with you. And thank you to Drs. David and Primavera for excellent comments uh, talking about some of the on the ground needed adaptation steps to take in the face of, of climate impacts, um, especially in the Philippines and other tropical areas. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now and, and show a few slides. And um, I'm going to zoom back out um, where we've been sort of focusing the previous two on uh, more local scale impacts and how to respond to them. I'm going to zoom back out just for a moment and review maybe some some ideas and concepts that probably most of the folks here are uh, listening are familiar with in aggregate, but uh, then want to use those to make a point about resilience and how we think about institutions uh, and, and how we deal with building resilience. So of course, everybody knows the, the Keeling curve. This is the classic curve showing increase in carbon dioxide over time and how we uh, is the basis for our definition of representative concentration pathways that we use to model and predict future pathways uh, for climate change. And those are of course based on the average concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So we predict IPC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uses three concentration pathways, 2.5, 4.5, 8.5, to think about uh, optimistic, moderate, and severe scenarios for climate change. So um, one of the ways in which the uh, uh, change in climate most affects the ocean um, is, of course, through the absorption of excess heat absorbed in the atmosphere as a result of increasing greenhouse gases. We don't often uh, think about this as a, as a major impact necessarily because so much of it um, of, of what we feel is, is, of course, here on land, but the ocean has actually absorbed about 93% of the total excess heat generated by the increasing concentration of greenhouse gases. It's a tremendous buildup of heat reservoir within the ocean um, that is still increasing rapidly um, and will continue to do so for, for many decades into the future, no matter which pathway we choose to take in the coming years. So John Edgar, at the start of um, this session, talked about some of the ways that these uh, this increased heat capacity is directly impacting um, marine tropical ecosystems in Southeast Asia, around the Philippines. And one of the ways that's gonna have the most direct impact on, on people is through reduction in the production capacity of the ocean. So what we've got here, this is our figures from the most recent IPCC report, special report on the oceans and cryosphere that came out two years ago. And on the top figure there, we can see um, observed changes in ecosystem productivity since the 1930s. And so we've already seen a decline of about 1% in key areas in the tropics uh, around the Philippines, Southeast Asia. But we're predicted to see, and again, this is over moderate scenarios here, we're not looking at the worst case scenario, decreases of up to 25% uh, by 2050. Now, if we go up to the worst case scenario, that decrease in productivity goes up to about 50% in total productivity in key areas of the globe. What you can see on the bottom is that this isn't just a change in total productivity, but this is also um, making itself uh, felt, these changes are making itself felt in the kinds of species and the number of species that are found in given areas. And basically the idea there is of course, as the ocean warms, species are gonna move, they're gonna migrate, they're gonna find waters that they're more familiar with in terms of temperature and, and climate. Another way of looking at this is to think about how many stocks are going to move and become transboundary stocks or stocks that migrate across exclusive economic zones. And this is work that was done by Pinsky et al. a couple of years ago. And what they've shown quite clearly is that as temperature increases, the number of transboundary stocks, number of uh, countries with new species is going to increase rapidly in the coming years. So one nation's national wealth is another's tomorrow. So I'm just gonna turn briefly here uh, away from the idea of climate to the idea of resilience and how we think about resilience and, and how we go about managing um, our ecosystems traditionally. Uh, and that's this idea as stated here by Desjardins that resilience is the capacity of a system to absorb change, it maintain a certain degree of integrity. 
And so uh, change can come from a lot of sources. It could come from climate, habitat degradation, fishing, other kinds of impacts. But we always try and manage towards some steady state. We want to retain the identity of a given ecosystem. So we manage our fisheries so that we can continue to maintain an optimum yield. We manage habitats, we preserve habitats so we can still preserve um, the benefits from those ecosystems. Um, in the unfortunate event, if we don't manage those uh, impacts well enough, we may hit a tipping point and be knocked into a new steady state, a new equilibrium that we then manage from. But we work on this principle, this idea that we're always managing towards some steady state. We're trying to maintain the identity of these ecosystems. But if species are on the move, is this model even really valid anymore? Well, we've certainly built up our national and international management regimes around this idea of steady state and management. This is just, of course, the uh, map of national regional fishery management organizations all built around managing various stocks globally. These are multilateral organizations uh, supported and undergirded by various treaties and the UNFAO, um, all sorts of agreements. And they're built around this idea of managing individual stocks towards some idea of equilibrium. But what if that equilibrium is really something of the past? What if there is no new steady state? And the point I want to make here today is that that's the world that we're moving into. To quote a friend of mine, stationarity is dead. The idea that we are managing or able to manage an equilibrium is not something that we, um, or something that we need to, to, to move on from. We need to think about how we build institutions that can build and manage towards flexibility, towards a more um, dynamic world, and recognize that uh, the world that we're managing for tomorrow is going to be different the day after that and the day after that. The kind of change that we've built up through the accumulated heat uh, in the ocean, through uh, the continuing expansion of seawater, the melting of glaciers on shore, um, is change that is going to continue for, for many, many, many decades into the future. And so these changes are things that we don't just adapt for now, but we have to think about how we are adapting well into the future and start to build institutions that can deal with that change and that dynamism. So I'll close there. Thank you, Whit. So we are now gonna move into the Q&A session. We have about 27 minutes, I think, by my clock for, for this panel. So if you have questions for the panel, please type it into the Q&A section, identify yourself and your institution. And if you want it to go to one specific panelist, go ahead and let me know. Otherwise I'll throw it out to the group. Um, while I let the Q&A fill up, let me go ahead and, and use the uh, prerogative, the autocracy of, of the moderator to ask a question, if you don't mind, to the whole panel. We labeled this uh, panel adapting to climate change, but I, I think it speaks to this um, problem we have, you know, the, the paradigm shift we're, we're trying to get to globally between combating climate change mitigating the worst effects of climate change and adapting to those effects we can't avoid. I wonder how you as science communicators are starting to think through this problem of uh, you know, telling people some things can be fought, some things can be mitigated, some things just have to be accepted. Laura, maybe I could start with you. Hi, Greg. Yes. Um, I, when I speak to, for example, high school teachers or or the younger kids. I tell, I compare this to uh, a family. Uh, so if your family is a, has a potential for, or has a history for heart problems, for example. Um, so I said, then you know, that's a possibility, a huge possibility that you will also be um, experiencing the same as you grow older. And then you have options. Uh, you can just ignore that. You know, you just don't think it's going to happen and then face the consequences of that. Or you can change your lifestyle, uh, do healthy stuff, eat healthy food, and, and in that way, possibly reduce the, the probability that you will also experience uh, heart problems when you get older. So I now equate climate change with uh, not an inevitable but something that is highly likely to impact you. And so now we have to stop saying, um, to stop that because you can't stop your history, for example, your DNA. 
but you can do something about it so that your possibility of surviving it will be much better. So I've shifted from fighting that having a heart attack, which, you know, but instead accepting that that's going to happen, a possibility of that, and therefore changing your lifestyle now. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Georgine? Actually, uh, the conversation on climate change uh, with the various audiences that they have, uh, mainly in rural areas, gives an opportunity for education, first of all. You know, what are mangroves? For many of them, they don't even know what mangroves are. Then we go to the past, what were mangroves and the traditional uses, the names. Then we go to the present and then to the future, you know. So it's uh, really, um, maybe it's a failure of education in the country. But it, you know, it gives uh, an opportunity to um, an opening for education for uh, natural uh, habitats, which I don't know if you're familiar with the Philippines, uh, Filipino children, they have so much junk in their heads, <laughs> you know, all the, uh, yeah, Laura is laughing. So, you know, it, it's really a challenge to, to, to educate them. But uh, I, I like your uh, uh this uh, mangroves going back, by the way, you know, that should be given free to all the elementary and high schools in the country because, you know, that's, that's very powerful. Yeah. Thanks, Eugene. How about you, Wit? Yeah, I, I like to think about how um, this, you know, I don't like to talk about climate change as an opportunity, but I, I do think that it is important to recognize that um, this is a, a point in which an inflection point uh, where we can break from how we've done things in the past and how we have that change is something that we have to deal with and that we have to understand how to meet, but it doesn't mean that we can't do so um, in ways that are going to give us new pathways and new directions, that there are going to be um, ways that we can grow and and change the mode of business or change um, the way that we relate with with each other um, and that we can use this moment uh, this inflection point in history to to do that um, we can take this this great motivating factor to um, bring folks together to talk about common goals in ways that maybe we weren't able to do so before thanks let me uh, let me dive into the queue, uh, and I, I would still encourage more folks to jump in. I know there uh, this is a intimidating topic uh, for those of us who don't have PhDs in marine science. Uh, but please, any, anything you want to ask, throw it at at our panelists. Let's see if we can stump them. So first, we have one for Georgine Primavera from uh, Redemptio Onda, who asked, other than the conversion of mangrove forests to fish ponds, are there other significant threats to mangroves? Uh, and to what extent are they of concern? He mentions a few here, uh, tan barking, uh, cutting for timber, charcoal making, et cetera. Okay, the first is conversion. And um, fortunately, uh, Philippine government has stopped conversion of mangroves to back to, uh, to fish ponds that's, that's stopped. But the problem is the mandate to revert the abandoned ponds back to mangroves that's not being uh, enforced, so that, that's a problem. The tan barking and the charcoal, those are minor. So conversion is one, but the transformation that has really not been documented, the paying, uh, robbing Peter, robbing the seagrasses to pay Paul, the mangroves, that's, that is really a crime. Uh, that's, there's not enough documentation of that, but I think it runs into the thousands of hectares. So that to me is, um, and it's getting into social media, you know, pictures of seagrass beds going to mangroves. So to me, that's a major threat that maybe should be addressed really uh, at the national level, especially by the environment uh, agencies. Yeah. Thanks, Eugene. Uh, the next, I think, makes sense for both Laura and Witt. So maybe I'll just go with, with each of you in order. So Neil Silva asks, Given all the phenomena you've just described related to climate change, um, and I think particularly WITS related to, to species migration, would it now be advisable to shift marine conservation efforts to species that are better able to grow in warming oceans and to foster 
populations, uh, uh, growth in organisms that contribute to CO2 reduction? Laura? Um, that's a two-part question and answer the second one. Um, there's also a uh, possibility of a uh, negative consequence to encouraging the production, for example, of more plankton by say iron fertilization and such. Um, if because your goal is to just sequester carbon, there can be so much uh, consequences that we do not know uh, what that can happen. For example, harm, uh, encouraging the growth of harmful algal blooms if you do that. You know? So that needs to really be studied and it's probably a per site basis where maybe in some areas it will work, but I think in a lot of areas it will actually cause devastating ecological consequences. So I think that I have to warn people again, against having a single goal and manipulating nature just because of that one single goal. Yes, I absolutely echo that. Geoengineering is not something that we should get into lately at all. There's, it's the land of unintended consequences and human history is rife with very, very bad examples of when we've tried to do, to, to do that. Um, I would say that the idea of, of carbon sequestration and conservation do go hand in hand very well. And Dr. Primaver brought that up as well in her talk about mangroves and opportunities there. And, and I think that the um, opportunity to talk about uh, conservation and restoration as modes for both mitigation and adaptation is really great. And so when you talk about protecting areas, finding areas that are going to maximize both kinds of benefits should be a key goal. So maximizing both the adaptive potential and the mitigation potential uh, for conserving areas, uh, whether it be marine, coastal, or, or terrestrial, is, is probably something that we all need to be thinking about at all levels of governance. And I include both the UN as well as you know, federal, state, and local uh, governments around the world. Um, I would say that uh, going to um, uh, offshore again to, to fisheries, um, the point I was trying to make is that we need to be preparing our uh, management institutions to be able to deal with uh, uh, changes in what they're managing. So the WCPFC, a very large regional fishery management organization, manages tuna uh, primarily and other highly migratory species in the Western Pacific Ocean. A lot of those tuna are gonna be moving and moving in some cases out of the WCPFC and other species are gonna be moving in. And, and so how do they set goals and how do they um, work with the governments that are part of that organization uh, to adjust for those? Um, what do you do in areas where you don't have effective regional governance uh, for transboundary stocks? We need to start planning for that, start building that regional capacity um, that's something that USAID I know is interested in doing right now around the globe. I know that the UN is thinking about that, but that's something that we need to be accelerating. Those kinds of institution building needs to go along with the conservation and mitigation programs that we're also talking about here. Greg, Greg may I add? Oh, please, Virginia. Yes, yes uh, not only uh, the animals move, the plants do move also, maybe much slower, but the mangroves have been documented to move up latit latitudinally. So maybe on a longer scale, um, that should be uh, factored in also. I think I, I, I'd like to follow up on this topic before we move on to the next question with, with uh, maybe one question for Wit and one for Laura, if you don't mind. So Wit, is the question of expected species migration just an overall negative for those countries like the Philippines and the tropics as species head to cooler climes or do we, I mean, are other species going to do just fine in a warm and more acidic tropical ocean? And, and maybe that balances things out. Well, I think, unfortunately, there's a general migration of species poleward. And so if, I probably can't recall back to my, the figure I showed, but if you saw there was a, a predicted change in, in productivity and what that means ultimately in returns from fisheries and polar areas or areas towards the poles actually do have some positive predictive uh, increase in production from the species moving forward. Um, but there's not very many species that are going to be moving into the tropics in the change scenario. So, um, and that's both because there just aren't species that, are gonna, that have adapted or been adapted to that, that warmer climb. We haven't had that uh, in modern history. Um, of course we have had it in prehistory, um, but also uh, because the um, overall 
physical environment is going to be, you know, it's, it's not just that fish aren't adapted for warmth, it's that there's going to be changes in the kinds of nutrients and, and plankton that are available. Uh, there's going to be a reduction in oxygen content. So I don't mean to be a doomsayer here. All I'm trying to say is that we need to be prepared for these changes and we need to sort of be forthright and honest with ourselves about both the scale of the change, but also the scale over time on which these changes are going to occur. Uh, Laura, I wanted to ask you and, and anybody on the panel is welcome to, to weigh in, but the, the big species that we haven't talked about that jumps to my mind or a whole lot of species are coral, right? Philippines middle of the coral triangle. Uh, coral don't love warmer, more acidic climates. What is the long-term effect going to be that's at this point maybe unavoidable for, for Philippine fisheries? Well, the, the good thing about this part of the world is the high biodiversity. And uh, therefore, the, some of the corals, which are known to be slower growing and uh, not, cannot really compete with the faster growing corals, may actually have the opportunity to do so now as the faster growing corals actually uh, migrate or uh, slowly die off. For example, in some parts of the Philippines, we already see that blue corals, which are really minor parts of our coral reefs here, are now starting to dominate some areas where mm -hmm. the coral, the, you know, the faster growing acropora and so on are now slowly either dying off because of climate change or previous anthropogenic impacts such as um, high nutrient load, uh, locally, a, uh, higher, uh, locally lower pH areas, for example, due to mariculture and so on. And we see that now blue corals are starting to take over that area. So I think um, in a large scale of things, uh, we may have wiggle room for, for adaptation, uh, local adaptation, but uh, certain species will definitely suffer from higher temperatures and uh, lower pH. But overall, maybe there, and if you go back to uh, geologically, we've also seen stratifications through the through millennia of blue coral domination, proper uh, domination, uh, back and forth. So I, perhaps there's a possibility of, of that happening this time around as well. Yeah, I just want to emphasize the point that was made about biodiversity and how there, that's really one of the, the key uh, pieces to, to a lot of this conversation is, is maintaining that biodiversity as a strength. Uh, ecosystems are, are resilient almost in direct proportion to how diverse they are and the opportunity for different species to come to the fore and take on roles of other species as, as uh, uh, changes occur. So, uh, you know, uh, we sometimes don't link effectively enough uh, climate ecosystem impacts with biodiversity loss. And so if there are things that we can be doing to mitigate biodiversity loss, that is also a great way to build more resilient ecosystems because you're allowing for the possibility that of adaptation. Uh, thank you. Let, let, me, let me step back again, go back into the, the Q&A here. So we have a question for Laura from John Brandon, uh, who's uh, with the Asian Society here in Washington. John uh, asked what the impact of uh, the adverse effect of rising sea levels on tens of millions of Filipinos is going to be on migration patterns, both internally and perhaps people leaving the country. And, and what challenges will that create for employment opportunities in the future? Uh, very good question. On the short term, in areas, for example, where we already see considerable relative sea level, sea level rise, which means not just a glo uh, global sea level rise, but also local ones due to subsidence, for example, um, we see that in the short term, meaning in decades time, people tend to just adapt their environment, you know, uh, start building their houses on stilt, start um, making use of small um, marine vessels, bankas, instead of uh, motorcycles, because they're now almost completely flooded all the time. But I think on the short term, there's a tendency for Filipinos to stick around. Uh, and not migrate. There's a, unfortunately or fortunately, there's a saying, I was born here, I'm going to die here. And that's how they're, that's how they're adapting on the short term. 
But I think on, on the much longer term, as we have more and more areas inundated, um, it will not only affect the communities uh, in, in habitation, but it also also affects the, a lot of our agriculture, which are low-lying low agricultural areas. And I think that is the one that will have the higher impact. You know, we are a rice-eating society, and a lot of our rice fields are located at um, near the coast or low-lying areas. And I think that has will have a greater cultural impact and also economic impact. Um, so, and um, aside from that, of course, there is the increase in salinity salinity in our groundwater, so salt water inclusion as your sea level rises, and we keep pumping out water from the ground. Uh, and that as well will have dire consequences um, in terms of both potable water and water for agriculture. Uh, may I add to this? Yes, please, Georgine. Yes. Uh, you know, a short-term um, adaptation of these tilts, but really uh, the green belt, you know, that's something that the Philippines, it's a no-brainer, except that maybe 99% of our Filipino policymakers have no brains. Oops, sorry. I shouldn't have said that. But really, with all those typhoons, you know, we should have at least 100 meter, meters of green belt. And the political will that is needed is you need all those fisher folk and other people, the, the gated communities, uh, expensive subdivisions near the sea, they have to be moved, you know, that needs political will because you cannot change uh, climate change. It's coming, you know, a sea level rise is coming. So uh, that to me is a no brainer because then if you have a hundred meters at least of um, green belt, not only of mangroves, but also beach forest, then your salinity intrusion, seawater intrusion would be mitigated, you know, a lot of problems would be solved. So uh, I, I do not know. I think not in my lifetime, it's not going to come about, although I've been saying this for the last 30 years that we should have a green belt. So maybe in my second lifetime, I just, I'm hopeful that it will come about. Yeah. Thank you, Georgine. I, I'm going to give what might be the last question to Jaime Naval. I've been saving this one because it's a good closer for the panel. Uh, Jaime said, you present a lot of information, alarming data. It seems like an uphill war. What do each of you consider the areas we must prioritize to drive governments and societies to seriously act? So I, I think this is a good opportunity for kind of what's your short list? If, you, if you've got a couple of must-dos in the next few years, what are they? Laura, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Um, I think we need to do the number crunching. How much uh, will it take to adapt and how much it will cost not to adapt? Um, I think we really have to seriously localize that number crunching because unfortunately that is what uh, a lot of the decision makers will listen to. So if we show them that if you don't do anything, all the development that has occurred in the last two decades will disappear just because you're not doing the correct uh, adaptation measure. Uh, I think that that will make them hear what all, everything that needs to be done. So we need Georgine. economy. <laughs> so we have to make it about dollars and cents. Unfortunately, yes. Georgine, what do you think? Uh, being an ecologist, my bias, of course, is for the habitats, not only marine, no? not only for the mangroves and uh, the coral reefs, but equally the upland, the terrestrial habitats, uh, what's happening in the Philippines, we know the floods and all these things. It's also the upland. You see all these slugs coming down and every typhoon uh, comes. You have all these huge slugs down the river that have been the cause of illegal logging. So, um, but then I think that goes back to policy and the policy makers to the politicians. So I don't know how it's really uh, very difficult, you know, um, at the end of a long career to, to see, to be hopeful, but still somehow maybe uh, focus on the younger people uh, that, that, that could be, uh, that could maybe make a, a better impact on, on education and forget the policy makers. Yeah. Uh, Whit? Well, I love the idea of focusing on the youth because uh, they're the ones who are going to have to be living in this world that's changing. Um, and they are, of course, ultimately going to be the most important folks for dealing with this challenge. 
but I really also like this idea of, of accounting and accountability and, uh, and talking about the, the cost of impact as part of the cost of, uh, or the mitigated, the, the, um, mitigated cost of, of, of not doing anything. Uh, we don't talk about that enough as part of the cost benefit equation, or rather we just talk about the cost equation. We don't talk about the benefit side of the equation. So I think that that's really important to put that into the marine context and the fisheries context and where I've been spending most of my time recently. Um, you know, there's a famous saying in fisheries that uh, trying to manage fisheries is like trying to count a forest if you were doing it in the dark with your eyes closed and the trees moved. So it's already really, really hard to manage fisheries. Um, and it's made uh, triply harder uh, by the fact that uh, there's all sorts of intentional miscounting. Uh, there's a whole lot of uh, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing in the world and a general level of opacity uh, on the world's fisheries as much as 35%, uh, and that's maybe a conservative estimate of the global catch is really unaccounted for. And it's pretty much impossible to manage those fisheries and fish stocks um, with that kind of bar. So if we're gonna actually manage our fisheries in a way that is going to allow sustainable uh, economic and food security for the billions of people who rely on fisheries in the coming decades, we need to do a much better job about transparency in global fisheries. So I'll close with that. Thanks, Whit. We're a, uh, we're a few minutes shy of our, of our supposed ending time of 9.05, but I'm gonna call it there because I said that was the closer. So that's, that's gonna be the closer. Um, we're gonna take our, our 30 minute break 33 minute break now. So I'd ask everybody uh, to stick around, join us again at 9.35 p.m. here, a.m. in Manila for our final, hopefully um, silver lining panel on paths for regional cooperation on all the issues we've discussed over the last three sessions. So thank you, Laura, Georgine, Witt, uh, and John Edgar, you've been great. And thank you all for sticking around. Okay. Uh, good morning again uh, to everyone. Thank you for uh, waiting during the intermission. We are now going to start the last panel of our conference, which has been running for basically three weeks on this uh, third session. We will have a discussion on regional cooperation initiatives. And we have two speakers uh, up for today, after which uh, Greg and I will then join in on the conversation. Uh, we have uh, Amanda Xiao of the International Crisis Group. Uh, Amanda is um, um, is the senior uh, analyst uh, for China in the crisis group, and she focuses on conflicts in which China plays an in important role and developments in China's foreign policy. Uh, prior to that, she was with the Center for, for Humanitarian Dialogue uh, and uh, also still overlooking uh, or, or overseeing projects related to China and South China Sea and US-China relations. And uh, so she brings with us a rich experience uh, in the uh, regions, uh, problems, and issues that do require cooperation. And then afterwards, we will have John McManus, uh, no stranger to the Philippines. He's married to a Filipina and has been uh, has spent a good part of his uh, life as well here in the Philippines. Uh, he is a professor of marine biology and fisheries at the Rosenstiel uh, School of the University of Miami. And he has been a very, very uh, active voice in coral reef uh, research uh, for the most part of his life. Uh, and um, so we're very happy to see him again here uh, to give us uh, an overview of also uh, cooperation activities now in the sciences. So uh, without uh, further ado, I turn it over first to Amanda. Uh, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jay. And uh, thank you to the University of Philippines and to CSIS for the invitation to speak. Uh, in my presentation today, I will discuss the ways in which the risks of incidents uh, in the South China Sea involving Coast Guards could be mitigated through regional dialogue and cooperation. Uh, Coast Guards are at the front lines of the South China Sea dispute and are often involved in low level incidents at sea that have the potential to escalate into larger conflict. In recent years, many of the littoral governments of the South China Sea have significantly invested in the buildup of their Coast Guard forces. China, in particular, has outpaced its neighbors in this regard, and that's prompted other governments to also prioritize the so-called Coast Guardization of their maritime forces. Um, so what we see today is really a region that increasingly relies on Coast Guard presence 
and Coast Guard patrols to assert and safeguard uh, maritime claims. At the same time, and we've heard this from previous speakers and sessions uh, in previous weeks, you know, fishing communities from a number of countries are increasingly seeking catch further from their shores, driven by economic pressures, inland fish stocks, uh, and government encouragement. So this creates an environment in which Coast Guard and fishing vessels from different countries and Coast Guards from different countries are encountering each other regularly in contested waters. Uh, some of these encounters uh, at sea are tense and sometimes even violent. Uh, encounters between just Coast Guard vessels have on the whole become less prone to major incident, though there are still some examples of aggressive maneuvering in close proximity. I mean, in just late April of this year, we saw some close maneuvering around Scarborough Shoal between Chinese Coast Guard vessels and Philippine Coast Guard vessels. Um, but some of the most unpredictable incidents tend to take place between fishing vessels and maritime law enforcement vessels from different countries in contested waters. Uh, these encounters have in recent years resulted in occasional ramming incidents, uh, even uses of lethal force. Uh, the scenarios in which these encounters are taking place are diverse. They range from encounters between individual fishing vessels and individual law enforcement vessels uh, to ones in which you see fleets, uh, a fleet of fishing vessels accompanied by a law enforcement vessel. Um, so these interactions have been the status quo in the South China Sea and will uh, continue to be the status quo for some time, you know, barring a major political breakthrough on the maritime disputes. Uh, in the meantime, countries involved do have an interest in ensuring that these interactions are more predictable, that those risks are managed uh, and incidents prevented. Uh, prevented. Uh, let me propose three ways to do so. Uh, first, the region could consider developing a set of common operating principles that guide Coast Guard behavior at sea. Um, these principles should draw from existing international law, from existing international agreements and standards that govern navigation and communications uh, and best practice. Uh, initial focus could be on adopting existing procedures on communications uh, and just standardizing communications between Coast Guard and fishing vessels. Uh, clear communications are an important first step in any scenario for clarifying intent and reducing the potential for misunderstanding. The region could also consider developing principles to govern boarding and inspection and expulsion of fishing vessels with a particular focus on developing understandings around how and when use of force is employed. Um, this is important because the region's maritime law enforcement actors have divergent standard operating procedures, positions, um, and laws on how to respond to foreign fishing vessels in contested areas. Uh, some countries are inclined towards more robust measures, uh, you know, including uh, boarding every vessel, ramming, shooting, uh, even firing warning shots at vessels, while other countries tend to prefer a less confrontational tactic, such as just monitoring or reporting on the vessel or maneuvering to encourage the vessels to leave. So the differences in approach can create inconsistencies for fishing vessels operating in the South China Sea that could then engender overreaction on the part of fishing vessels. The differences in approach could also fuel misunderstanding and create tensions between Coast Guard vessels of two different countries. So these sorts of discussions can help to ensure that fishermen engaged in normal fishing activities uh, are treated in a just and humane way. Um, the region wouldn't have to start from scratch on these principles. There are plenty of existing international agreements that contain relevant language that could be adopted. Um, a lot of work has also taken place at the informal level on developing language on a set of common operating principles. And here uh, I'm referring to the work of my former organization, the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, which has been running a series of informal discussions, uh, including tabletop exercises between the Coast Guards uh, since 2015. Um, so that's one, developing a set of common operating principles. Two, uh, interconnected with a discussion on principles for Coast Guards, the region can also develop a set of common expectations 
for how fishing vessels should behave. Um, you know, with the proliferation of fishing vessels sponsored by governments to engage in sovereign rights protection activities or maritime militia, there is a need for the region to begin to discuss collectively what defines normal fishing vessel activity and what defines maritime militia activity and how the two categories should be treated differently from the law enforcement perspective. Um, and finally, uh, my third proposal is that the region could consider a multilateral forum where the key coast guards of the South China Sea can come together to raise operational concerns and define, uh, identify areas of shared interest. Uh, there are plenty of precedents in other regions to look to, including the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, the North Pacific Coast Guard Forum, uh, et cetera. Um, so a theoretical South China Sea maritime law enforcement forum could serve as a regular platform where the key Coast Guard actors of the South China Sea could raise concerns related to recent incidents at sea, related to operational safety, um, exchange information around shared transnational priorities, uh, and contribute to regional norms building, such as the ones I outlined before. Uh, so let me end by uh, addressing some of the political obstacles that have hindered uh, and will continue to hinder regional cooperation. The, me the momentum for regional cooperation on the South China Sea has slowed. Uh, ASEAN and China haven't had substantive discussions on the COC, uh, substantive discussions since the start of the pandemic. Uh, both because there is a lot of skepticism in the region over what that process will produce and because there was reluctance to engage over video platforms. Um, the ASEAN China foreign ministers meeting, the ASEAN defense ministers meetings both recently called for an early conclusion to the COC talks. This means that we can probably expect joint working group discussions to resume at some point, which is a positive development. Uh, however, the strategic distrust in the region, the sensitivity of the dispute, you know, varying levels of political will among the parties involved means that there is a floor to how deep those discussions will go and how fleshed out a final COC can be. And this is an issue that pervades all ASEAN China discussions on the South China Sea. So on the Coast Guard front, you know, I think the space for reaching understanding is larger in a minilateral configuration. Uh, this could be the claimant countries or the claimant countries that are active on maritime law enforcement. It could involve the sequencing of multiple tracks of discussion, for instance, one involving just the Southeast Asian claimants and one that brings in China. Um, and I want to emphasize that the process is just as important if not more important than whatever outcome is produced. Um, like many other things, regional Coast Guard cooperation has been hindered by the global pandemic. Communications will and still do take place over video platforms, but that can't fully replicate uh, in-person diplomacy and dialogue. Um, at the same time, operations of sea, at sea have continued unabated as we have seen recently. So in this period of remote diplomacy with the potential for misunderstanding and misinterpretation higher than before, um, it's important for the region to take a harder look at ways to mitigate uh, and reduce risks at sea. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Amanda. Uh, and now uh, on to uh, John. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about some options for cooperative management uh, of the fisheries environments in the South China Sea and um, uh, emphasize uh, basically what everybody has already agreed to do. Uh, and by that, I mean um, all of the uh, claimant countries in the South China Sea uh, have uh, uh, ratified the United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea, Article 123. Uh, says specifically that states bordering enclosed or semi-enclosed sea should cooperate with each other uh, in uh, the rights and so forth and to coordinate the management, conservation, exploration, and exploitation of living resources, coordinate the protection and preservation of the marine environment, coordinate their scientific research, and invite invite as appropriate other interested states to cooperate 
with them uh, in the furtherance of, um, of this issue. So this is the South China Sea. Uh, what you're seeing are the, uh, the, the red spots are actually um, coral reefs that uh, I've verified uh, through satellite imagery have actually, uh, are actually right at the surface. And for every um, square meter of uh, surface breaking coral reef, there's uh, um, two more um, uh, units in, in subsurface reefs that just don't get to the surface. So those are the ones that are actually in pretty good shape. But the fisheries here are very important. It's 12 to 15% of the world's catch coming out of here. Uh, on the coastline here, a study that um, my wife did actually for the um, uh, for the Transboundary Waters uh, Assessment Program of UNEP uh, showed that there's well over 30 million people living below the poverty line in those coastlines and fisheries is critical <coughs> to that whole system. Now, <coughs> the problem of coordinating um, formally uh, is, is uh, sort of um, <coughs> between the cracks. It, it's been um, uh, hasn't been properly addressed. So what we have that covers this area are the Western Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. Um, but you see, it's this huge area. And I talked to the former chair of this, and he says, yeah, there's nothing we can do. It just covers too many places. Um, as of uh, the 40s, I think about 1948, there has been the Asian Pacific Fisheries Commission. And, and this does meet, um, and it covers uh, the Clayman areas and, and several others, these were sort of patched on to it. Um, but again, it's, it's a bit too big and it covers uh, freshwater fisheries. Uh, so the, the outgoing chair uh, was the Philippines and then the person uh, who was doing that is actually a freshwater um, <coughs> aquaculture guy. And now the uh, chair Chair is with China, and we'll see how that goes. But you see, it's again, it's too big. Then there's the CEF deck, uh, which Georgina used to work for, actually. Uh, this is a technical assistance, a high level technical assistance group, but it doesn't cover management. You see, it's, it's leaving large areas of the South China Sea uh, alone. And then there's uh, for the United Nations Environment Program. There's COBC, the coordinating body in the seas of, South, of East Asia. And they do things like, uh, there's a Global Environment Facility Project. This is a big funding organization, it's international. And uh, they had a South China Sea study and there's, there's a, uh, at least one or possibly two follow-up studies going on now. But uh, China insisted that they only do the coasts so they don't actually have anything to do with uh, the offshore areas, and, and they don't emphasize fisheries. So <clears throat> in addition to those, uh, there's informal and track two efforts, um, meaning not, you know, uh, high level in the government. Um, there's informal working groups on the South China Sea from 1993 until 2001, and they had um, 17 technical working group meetings, uh, 11 expert group meetings, two study group meetings. Um, and this was funded by Canada. And for some reason, Canada was insisting that they actually solve the problem and then they didn't solve the problems. And so they cut off funding. I think that was a dreadful mistake. You want to keep people talking. So <laughs> then there was the Jom Street Cruises, which was very good. It kind of branched off of this. And Vietnam and the Philippines uh, did uh, a series of four cruises in the South China Sea. Um, they got permission from China to do this. That's one reason I wasn't allowed on board. But my wife went, she's from the Philippines, and <clears throat> she says that they were in the middle of the cruise that she was on and they were, they were um, buzzed by a Chinese fighter plane. So <laughs> everybody had to had to um, go into a sort of a protective mode. So it, it, it was tense, but they, this was a good idea. And then that fourth cruise, they invited some others, including some, someone from Laos, which was significant. There's this Center for Humanitarian Dialogue meetings that um, 
uh, Amanda was actually involved with. And I got to go to one in Beijing uh, about, uh, almost two years ago now. And it was, it was very good. Uh, we have to uh, explain to sort of political science people that when uh, ecologists and fisheries people get together, we usually get along really well. <laughs> there's, there's some diplomats, they say, oh, why should I go to these meetings? All we do is, you know, stand hard on our positions. But no, all of the ecologists and fisheries people in all of the countries want to take care of the situation. They do talk well. And there were several of these meetings and I haven't um, found out if there's gonna be follow-up. I hope they keep going. Uh, the South China Sea Catch Reconstruction by the University of British Columbia um, was published in uh, 2015. The process of that includes pulling together experts through the region and actually coming up with what uh, is going on. Um, there was a, a meeting in Taiwan in 2017 uh, where uh, all of the regional uh, fisheries organizations were invited, but uh, the Philippines didn't even send somebody. And so it was, it was kind of um, uh, you know, disappointing, but also because the idea was let's combine our catch data the catch data doesn't tell you the story. <laughs> As Whitley pointed out earlier, it's, it can be off by 30, 40, uh, 50%. So there's no real point to that. Instead, catch reconstruction. You look at all of the information uh, about the catch landings, and you do this through markets or, or, or um, surveys, anything you can to actually fill in so you've got the illegal and unreported um, catch. And there's also a lot of other occasional meetings and coastal projects, but nothing that's consistent, nothing that's leading to any kind of commitment or, or um, you know, government um, decision making. So um, the, the, the conclusion from this is that there is a need for a formal management group capable of speaking on behalf of the governments composed only of the claimant governments. You don't want to have all these other governments in these meetings. It's just the claimant governments, uh, but with informal observers and advisors. So some options for doing this um, would be a South China Sea Regional Fisheries Management Organization connected with the UN FAO. FAO generally will help to set these up and help to find funding. And the newer ones are supposed to be much more effective than the older ones by putting in some kind of um, commitment uh, capabilities. Uh, or you could take the Asia Fish, uh, Pacific Fisheries um, uh, Commission and, and make a subgroup of that. And they actually have a little bit of a, um, uh, a conflict resolution thing built in uh, or uh, something that a CN plus China could come along with and set aside. Anything you do has to include Taiwan because Taiwan is a major fisheries uh, group in all of this. And, and it's not that, it, it, there are international um, meetings which use uh, the government of Taipei, for instance. Um, and it, it is possible to set this up that way, but whatever happens, it has to include Taiwan, otherwise, what's the point, really? Um, so there are other possibilities, and these are just things to, to um, discuss, discuss. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, John. I noticed you had the last slide. You didn't flash it. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh it did go up. Yeah. I think it was your farewell slide or something, the ending slide. Anyway, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> thank you, John. Uh, perhaps, uh, Greg, um, since uh, we'll be taking off uh, on these discussions, perhaps some comments from you first before we uh, then move off into the Q&A. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Um, well, first of all, John, don't worry, we can fix all the uh, glitches in post. That's the great thing about Zoom. Um, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll live forever, nice and clean on YouTube. Uh, so I, I, what Jay and I thought we'd do at this point is try to um, synthesize some of the 
more positive, actionable things I think came out of, of the last five panels, really, um, as well as, as, of course, things that have been kicking around our brains in, in our own work the last few years. And um, I'm going to avoid climate change because we heard more than enough um, from much smarter people in the last panel. But on day one, the focus was, was more in my wheelhouse, which was fisheries management and especially maritime domain awareness. So I guess I'll, I'll start, start there. One of, the, one of the things that dovetails very nicely with what John just ended on is it's very clear that we need, the region needs um, multilateral fisheries management mechanisms that don't currently exist. And it doesn't need to be a one size fits all for everything, but in the West Philippine Sea, South China Sea, as John said, there is nothing, no management mechanism that's effective. And it's not going to happen under ASEAN. And Laos doesn't have a stake in the fisheries of the South China Sea or, or Myanmar for that matter. And so you need some kind of mechanism, be it formalized or, or informal, that runs in parallel to the current COC process. Um, and Amanda may be more optimistic than me, or maybe not, I don't know. But I think we can all agree that the COC process is not moving fast enough for the um, you know, critical nature of the fishery stock collapses in the region. So whether you think there will eventually be a code of conduct for the South China Sea or not, logically you have to think that there should be a parallel fisheries discussion that happens outside of that. Because if the COC takes another 10 years, there won't be any fish left to catch in the South China Sea in that time. Um, and that doesn't have to undermine ASEAN centrality. That it can, it's perfectly acceptable for ASEAN to endorse many lateral mechanisms to manage sub-regional issues. They do it with the Mekong, they do it with the Malacca Straits, they do it with the Sulu Sea. The South China Sea need not be the exception to that general rule. Um, on the um, maritime domain awareness front, one of the things that really came out of our panel on uh, day one was the need for a greater focus on the emerging, you know, orbital commercial sector. Of course, there will always be um, a role for manned platforms. Boats and planes have to be involved at some point as the traditional shore-based receivers and radar. But we're approaching a future very rapidly where anybody with the right subscriptions will have enough data to see any boat moving on the seas, at least if it's made of metal and bigger than say five meters. And the thing that's gonna divide countries are those who have access and those that don't, those who can crunch the data and those that don't, and maybe especially those who have the interagency processes and the information sharing agreements to make uh, use of that or don't. And so regionally, one of the things that really needs to be baked more into the existing regional discussions and, and um, uh, regional institutions, be they the ASEAN uh, heads of Coast Guard meetings or whatnot, the ASEAN Maritime Forum is this idea of incorporating remote sensing and better information sharing. Um, you know, there's been a lot of great work done between Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines uh, over the last, what, four years, three years maybe on, on the Sulu and so the sea patrols. Far more could be done incorporating these commercial tools that are already available and much, much cheaper than trying to do coordinated manned patrols. Um, there's been talk for a couple years now about establishing the ASEAN single maritime point of contact, this idea of kind of a, a whole of ASEAN hotline um, for maritime crises, which may or may not involve outside parties like China. And, and also having a network of ASEAN single points of contact in each country. So at, if you are the Philippines and you end up with one of your fishermen arrested by the Malaysians or you arrest a Malaysian fisherman or Vietnamese get arrested, you know who to call. There's the equivalent of a, of a phone book that you know this is the guy that I call in Hanoi to coordinate this so we don't end up in a political crisis. That basic information sharing could go a long way toward more effective crisis management and more effective maritime domain awareness. Whether you care about stopping terrorists or smugglers or illegal fishers or Chinese maritime militia boats, all of it comes down to you being able to see more effectively what's going on in your own waters. Um, the last point I'll make on that is we have seen an interesting parallel development in both the Philippines and Vietnam over the last 
four months in the wake of the Whitson Reef standoff, which if, if we're going to call it standoff, in which we've had both the Philippines and Vietnam sending out increasing patrols to areas of the Spratlys to identify and then publicize uh, identifying information about militia vessels, recognizing that at some point, you know, no matter how much cool tech you have, somebody's eventually got to get close enough to take a picture to positively ID one of these boats. But that's been entirely uncoordinated as far as I can tell. Um, you know, Amanda talked a bit about the idea of having a regional mechanism to better identify and then decide what the rules of engagement are. How do we treat legally these militia actors? Part of that could simply be a multilateral or minilateral effort to identify them in the first place, uh, which could involve outside parties like the US, the Australians, the Japanese, or it could be an intra-ASEAN process. Um, but whatever it is, it would certainly both help with maritime domain awareness and would help pressure the neighbor to the north to explain its behavior or stop using paramilitaries altogether. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll stop there. That's, that's all I've got on day one. Thank you, thank you, Greg. Actually, looking back as well uh, on, on the the previous uh, sessions, I find uh, some very interesting points raised by by the contrasts uh, in each session. On day one, uh, where we talked about protecting threatened fisheries first, and then maritime domain awareness, I think uh, there we brought up uh, or we we brought up a very good example of how a problem such as the threat to fisheries, no. Uh, really requires a common um, understanding uh, that in turn requires us to have uh, sources of information and data. And one thing that sort of stood out is that we're still grappling with, um, with even the basic question, how threatened are uh, these fisheries? We know they're threatened, but exactly how much and what can we do? What kinds of intervention can we uh, carry out? Uh, that is still uh, subject to some uncertainty, uncertainty shall we say, due to the uh, absence of, of, of full complete information, which is what the maritime domain awareness session really also tried to sort of uh, offer some solutions to. Uh, and I think this is a common issue. These threatened fisheries are actually a common issue for all of the uh, nations uh, in this region. And so that's something that uh, probably needs to be really uh, taken up as, uh, as Greg said, as a separate conversation from these uh, disputes, just getting a common uh, picture, you know, a common understanding of exactly what is the status of these uh, resources in the region. Um, maybe that will help then um, um, encourage uh, more and more uh, cooperation, which is what we are trying to also talk about in this third session. In the second session, you had uh, another contrast in the sense that you had a very, very clear crisis, a clear problem of plastic pollution that was so visible and visceral. And you think that this is something that everyone uh, will immediately understand requires uh, cooperative and common action. I mean, no question that everyone is threatened by this problem. But then the second session also brought up um, the re some reasons why it seems that even just addressing a common problem is such a huge uh, obstacle. Uh, and that is with respect to attitudes and, and positions basically about uh, the law, no? the law of the sea and, and basically the norms by which we should operate in trying to address this clear common problem uh, at sea, no? the law of the sea and how it's been used or how it has played a role in the dispute so far seems to be a, um, a kind of obstacle conceptually for people to just go ahead and, and deal with the issue. Uh, but at, at the same time, it also brought up uh, another uh, uh, problem that because of the way in which we're very concerned about the, the broad disputes, you now we forget about the practical uh, impacts of this to you know, common people who are directly affected by uh, what's happening uh, at sea. And so this session actually is, very, is a very good uh, um, um, way, I guess, to bring to the front no, the, the questions of how do we deal with this now? With um, adapting to climate change being one of the, uh, another one of those uh, uh, key issues uh, in the seas you know, uh, with respect to our oceans that we need to, to grapple with. You know, and it's not just about individual claims uh, to areas, but really the, you know, the survival of our own people, especially along the coastline 
as we all face these uh, changes. No? So this last session on regional cooperation, I find uh, uh, it is a good uh, opportunity to then ask, no? uh, given all that we've, we've discussed, no? uh, some key questions like, um, what can si uh, no, what can the, the politics, the social side of it learn from the sciences? No? Um, John brought up some examples of uh, cooperation that have been undertaken with relative, you know, with, with different levels of success. But the, the key, I think, there is the fact that the different countries were able to actually at least sit uh, in one table you know, and come to some common understanding uh, of what needs to be done or what the problem is, even if uh, they weren't able to go uh, beyond that. You no, know? that was for the next step. You no, know? so. The question is, how do we, um, um, well, well, what can we learn from this cooperation, these previous experiences in cooperation, and how do we use them to improve uh, future proposals, future efforts? No? How do we, and then how do we transform uh, talk, which is what, what has been, seems to be even most successful before, how do we then transform talk into actual action? And some proposals uh, uh, were raised uh, also by Greg about some possible, uh, and by the speakers about some possible um, initial efforts, you know, where we just get people to talk and then hope that then that can then be more seriously taken up you know, uh, and, and be transformed into action. And probably from all these experiences, we can also learn what are the, uh, you know, the monkey wrenches in a way, the, the non-starters to cooperation which have already been encountered before you know? um, and and from that experience learn how to sort of anticipate and prepare for them as we try out uh, new uh, um, efforts so that's what i that's what i can take away from uh, the discussion so far so i hope that the audience also will have been able to pick up on this uh, and uh, without we would now want to of course uh, broaden this discussion and we're open to uh, questions uh, in the Q&A, you can submit it in the Q&A or on the, the chat. No? And there are already a couple of questions in the Q&A box, I noticed. Um, okay. Probably uh, we'll take up the first question from Tukpam of the DAV. It's a question addressed to both uh, Amanda and Greg. Uh, how, how do you formulate separate incident prevention codes between the different maritime forces operating in the South China Sea? such as well, he gives examples then of, of many different possible uh, uh, interactions. No? So I guess the, the, the key problem there is, is the, the practical aspect of it. How do we even get these uh, people, these uh, different offices and forces to sit down and agree on these uh, codes? Amanda or Greg? Yeah. Amanda, do you want, you've um, got more practical experience trying to herd cats uh, on, on this stuff, right? Uh, yeah, um, it, it's a really good question. And it, it reminds us of sort of how complicated these interactions can be. Um, I guess the first response for me would be, um, where is the platform to even begin to discuss um, these questions? And currently, there is no sort of home to have these discussions beyond, uh, right now, there's really just informal level discussions that are happening. There are some efforts taking place uh, under the joint working group uh, working on the implementation of the DOC that are also beginning to take place, uh, but they are not regularly scheduled. So right now there's not really a home for these discussions. The second point I would make is simply that it might be more useful to define interactions according to the function of the vessels rather than the type of vessels they are. Um, and what I mean by that is um, a number of countries do rely on their naval vessels to conduct law enforcement in addition to their Coast Guard vessels. And so there is a sort of dual nature sort of function happening here where it's not just, it's not just Coast Guard vessels engaged in law enforcement activities. Um, as well, you see that fishing vessels are not simply just fishing vessels or maritime militia vessels. They're often just 
fishing vessels who are engaged in the moment, either in fishing activities or maritime militia sovereign rights protection activities. So it might be more useful to consider it from a functions perspective rather than this is the type of vessel and then we will proceed to interact with it in this way. It would be more, this is how the vessel is behaving according to some sort of criteria that we all sort of understand. And therefore this is how we should respond. I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I, the, the artificiality of discussions around how do you do a Coast Guard to Coast Guard code, a Coast Guard to Fisheries code, a Navy to Coast Guard code, that's, that's always been a problem in this discussion. Navy to Navy is easy. Um, we have more than enough rules, regulations, and, and fora to discuss Navy to Navy. Now, the problem, of course, is that you know, things like cues, the code for unplanned encounter of the sea only works if the encounter was unplanned. And most of the time in the South China Sea, it's not. So if you were intending to pick a fight, obviously you're not going to use cues. And one party in particular often does not use the bridge to bridge communication protocols already baked into cues. So if it's not working for Navy, of course it's not going to I lost. Greg, you're, you're muted. I'm sorry. I, I think I smacked my keyboard. I, uh, so I, I was going to say, I don't think this is going to be a singular platform or a singular document that would actually result in, in this kind of list of, you know, here's, you flip, I, this is a, a militia boat. I'm going to flip to page 32 and it tells me what I'm supposed to say over the radio and then who I'm supposed to call if we get in trouble. I think you're going to have this kind of web of interlocking norms that develop. So for instance, uh, Malaysia and Vietnam signed a recent hotline agreement uh, that is clearly meant to de-escalate incidents involving Malaysian arrest of Vietnamese fishers. You've got Indonesia and Vietnam trying to do the same. You could have this kind of iterative inter-ASEAN discussion that involves how one deals with arrest of fishermen, particularly in disputed waters. You know, if the Indonesians arrest Vietnamese over the median line where Vietnam doesn't recognize Indonesia's claims and so on. One big thing we have to admit, though, is that that is likely to be bifurcated. There are likely to be ASEAN norms that develop and then ASEAN China norms that develop. And China is very unlikely to agree to the norms that work within ASEAN, at least for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, interestingly, that, that question raises even uh, an issue about the entire code of conduct idea, which is supposed to be this big code uh, to discuss uh, or to handle uh, incidents of all kinds. No? And uh, it raises the question whether it's actually wise to try to come up with a big code, no? trying to address all of them in just one document, or if it would be more appropriate to sort of break it up into smaller agreements that are built up over time so that your code is actually one that's created through experience and application rather than you know, theoretically thought of by people uh, and, and then um, um, imposed on the ground. So that, that, that does raise that uh, question. Uh, let, let's go to the second question for John, I believe. Um, well, there are two of them. Uh, do we have data on how much of the world's food demand is supplied by the resources in the South China Sea? And would it, would it be possible to have disputed portions of the South China Sea declared as a marine biodiversity area and treated as some sort of sanctuary which should not be exploited for marine and fuel resources? I think, John, this, this is right up your alley because you did come up with that proposal for a marine peace park. Uh, what do you think, given now the situation and developments, what would be the configuration, I guess, of this, uh, this uh, peace park? Uh, given uh, the current developments, no, and how would that, uh, what role would that play in in the the food, uh, I guess, the food security of the region no? as well as the world? Uh, let me take care of the first one first. It's it's between twelve and fifteen percent of the world's fish catch that's coming out of the South China Sea, and uh, that just depends on what year and what kind of data source there is, and, um, and at least 10% of the fish stocks are known to be, um, are believed to be in serious trouble. And uh, we think it's well over double overfished. In other words, there's twice as much fishing going on as would be better 
uh, as could return uh, at least as much catch and the countries are losing at least a million tons a year uh, of fish because of the overfishing. But for the, um, the disputed, um, uh, the, the, the marine biodiversity areas, um, uh, yeah, for uh, since 1992, uh, uh, we've been talking about, uh, say, a Spratly Island Peace Park. Uh, right now, though, if you look at the map um, <laughs> that, that uh, Greg helps to keep track of, uh, it was either 69 or 70 military outposts scattered across the, those, those places. And, and many of them are just on reefs that don't have any uh, high tide features. And so it's difficult to look at the map and say, well, this would be a great park to come and visit. Um, <laughs> but I think um, that the, the, there's a possibility for um, uh, Bajo de Massenloc, um, this is Jay's expertise actually, uh, but because uh, uh, Scarborough Reef or Scarborough Shoal, they call it officially, just a scientifically incorrect term, but um, that, that's claimed by China and the Philippines. And Taiwan also claims it, but I have good reason to believe that if there was a conservation program going on, ta Taiwan would try not to mess with it. <clears throat> so that, that could actually be uh, a peace park, uh, similar to the Turtle Islands between Malaysia and the Philippines. Uh, and it should be managed the way that the Philippines is managing Tubataha Reef. Keep people on boats. Don't, don't let them land. <laughs> and uh, of course, there's not much to land on except some, some boulders. So that, that could be a big breakthrough. But this is why um, my recent emphasis has been on uh, just getting a regional organization. Uh, we, we need to talk about, have people talk about what their uh, problems are with catching fish, and what are, where are the fish going, and all of this sort of thing. As I mentioned before, you get a bunch of fisheries uh, people together, environmental people together, and they get along. <laughs> China has plenty of conservationists. Their fisheries people are very interested in making sure that fish stocks don't collapse. And so it's much easier to uh, deal with international relations and confidence building through uh, uh, meetings of uh, fisheries and environment people than it is through political experts. Uh, so I, I think that that's that's really the thing to go for. But uh, specifically for what you're talking about, I think that Scarborough um, is, is a good uh, uh, target for uh, uh, joint discussions. It's, it's got to be that China really thinks that's a good idea. And um, so that, that makes it, it's, it's a possibility, but not an immediate one. Jay, can I, I just add two things here? So on, on John's last point, I think the real key is that it has to be done bilaterally in the case of Scarborough or multilaterally in the Spratleys. Unilateral declarations of MPAs will be counterproductive because they invite violation intentionally by the other states, right? If the Philippines declares a peace park in the Spratleys, then Vietnam feels it must go fish there to show that it doesn't recognize Philippine jurisdiction. China will do the same. It's the same thing we see right now around Scarborough with the unilateral Chinese annual ban. The Philippine government says, go out and fish. Not because the Philippines want to overfish Scarborough, because it wants to show it doesn't respect the Chinese ban. And so that becomes counterintuitive, where of course officials want to just go and do something if there's a potential catastrophic fish stock collapse coming and the COC process mm -hmm. is stuck, but that could end up blowing up in their face. And the other thing I'd add is John referenced the 12 to 15% of so a fish catch figure, uh, which comes from the UBC study that, that you talked about. And the other thing that UBC study found or estimated that, that grabs me is that while it's 12% of global fish catch, it's up to half of all the fishing boats in the world operate in the South China Sea, which means the vast majority are small scale fishers, artisanal fishers from mainly the Philippines and central Vietnam. If stocks collapse, they're not distant water fishing boats that can go fish somewhere else. They're not gonna be operating off the Galapagos. They're gonna be out of work, right? They're, they're gonna lose yeah. the fish that they mainly catch to put on their tables. 
And that's one thing that, that gets lost when we think of IUU fishing and this idea of massive distant water fleets. That's not what we're talking about in the South China Sea. Yep. Yeah, good point, let, good me, point. let me also add um, that uh, there are actually protected areas. Um, uh, Malaysia has just put in a very large one. Now they're more you know, to the south and uh, on a shelf area, but they've, they've set aside the Luconia um, Shoals area as a very large uh, marine protected area. Vietnam has one official and possibly a couple of others uh, in process as uh, marine parks and marine reserves. Um, Taiwan uh, has an official reserve up in the uh, section which is nearest to actually China, mainland China, uh, the uh, Pratas, what we used to call Pratas, is, so I call it Dongsha because both claimants speak Chinese. Um, <clears throat> and um, the, uh, they also have a base in the middle of the Spratlys, north, north middle, um, called Taiping. And they haven't declared it a park, but they, they maintain it as a park. Um, so they're thinking of uh, declaring it. And the Philippines is always talking about declaring the place. And of course, then you get into um, the concern that by declaring it, you're, you're uh, going to upset China. And uh, this is something that has to, uh, has to be sort of, the odds have to be worked out. It may be um, worthwhile <laughs> and maybe China won't do anything about it, um, but um, th this is what has to happen. So this was something we came up with uh, in a meeting in Taiwan uh, several years ago when we decided that uh, multilateral uh, peace park wasn't really on the table, uh, that uh, each country should go out and try to protect things. And um, that's sort of happening in, in a little bit, uh, bits and pieces. But Malaysia has taken the big step and that's a huge area that they've set aside. Thank you, John. That, that, that's great. Um, that seems to give us an idea that maybe one good exercise to carry out would be to try to map all these proposed or, or already in place uh, formal and informal protected areas no? uh, and get a sense of how the countries are doing in at least trying to preserve some part of this uh, uh, disputed uh, region. Um, and also with respect to Greg's comment about the need for a multilateral um, action no? in order for any protection to really be uh, effective. No? Uh, that that uh, brings to mind, reminds me of, of, of the ASEAN China Declaration of a Decade of Marine Environmental Protection back, what was that, 2017 or 2018, after which nothing has happened so far. <laughs> Maybe they can use that. They still have, what, um, six more years or five more years to go uh, to actually follow up on that declaration and, and, and do something along those lines. Okay. So uh, let's go to the third uh, question for both panelists. Uh, well, given that you've had uh, varied experiences with ASEAN plus mechanisms or various mechanisms and cooperation in using the ASEAN platform, would it be possible to leverage ASEAN plus mechanisms into a forum to start the discussions you propose given that these already exist? Or do you think that, or does your experience with ASEAN's inertia make this not advisable? Uh, I know that ASEAN has so many uh, fora, it's, it's confusing sometimes to just keep track of what they're discussing with each letter, uh, with, with each additional letter. But um, uh, maybe that's something uh, that, that uh, someone can um, speak to. Speak to. Um, Amanda or Jean? Or yeah, Greg, sure. maybe. I'm, I'm happy to try to tackle that. Um, like you said, there's a lot of ASEAN uh, plus mechanisms. So maybe I'll tie it into a, a comment on the COC I wanted to uh, come back to, um, which is that, uh, you know, I think given that there are a number of obstacles that, that I was mentioning before that really puts a floor on how deep those COC discussions can go. I think Jay, you were alluding to that as well. Um, and as well as you, Greg, that um, should we really be waiting for a COC to generate the sort of regional solutions that are needed 
really immediately. Um, and I think the answer is that we, I, I don't see the COC as being such a detailed agreement, even if it comes out in 10 years, uh, detailed to the point that you would that it would actually get into the nitty gritty of fisheries management or even of you know guidelines that would govern interactions at sea. I think at most a COC may set out a series of principles around the will to work together on fisheries management and on preventing incidents, but it will not likely go further than that. So given that reality, regardless of the what we all, when we all think the COC will be completed. So given that reality, I think that means that necessarily there needs to be uh, other efforts in parallel. Um, or, uh, you know, you can, I think there's currently, there's some creative thinking around having the joint working group platform sort of authorize discussions below them, right? So sort of the, you know, additional platforms that then report to the joint working group, right? And then there you maintain a sort of channel to official talks to, to avoid you know, concerns around duplication, uh, et cetera. That, that's one way of doing it. You can pursue minilateral efforts. Uh, and I think bilateral efforts can go some ways towards creating norms. If you have a series of bilateral agreements whose substance uh, is more or less the same with regards to incident prevention or Greg, you're mentioning the Vietnam Malaysia uh, example. Um, th there are bilateral agreements that we can draw from to start that norm building process. So it doesn't necessarily have to be this big sort of ASEAN plus China or ASEAN plus platform um, to push this sort of uh, cooperation. No. Yeah, if I can add, um... Uh, I was honored to be uh, one of the um, uh, sort of plenary speakers at the uh, annual uh, ASEAN uh, Fisheries and Environment Forum. And this that, that was the time it was in Thailand and in Bangkok. And it was quite an interesting experience. There were, it was a mixture of fisheries and environment people and uh, sort of diplomat, uh, government representatives. And so it, it went fairly well. We were discussing situations. It was no, nowhere near as productive as the meeting that Amanda uh, had organized in Beijing. Uh, but at least, you know, everything was pretty cordial. And then uh, about a third of the way in, um, we heard the dreaded statement, uh, but everybody knows that uh, the South China Sea has belonged to China since time immemorial. And that's like, that is the party line on this. And so that was not from a fisheries or environment person. That was from somebody who, who just didn't like the way things were going with the conversation. So that's the, which you're losing by going through anything to do with uh, a CN or any, in fact, any, um, uh, anything that involves um, uh, policy people uh, outside mm -hmm. of fisheries and environment. You want to keep this. Uh, we know these. Uh, this stock is declining. What should we do? You know, we're we're all desperate to keep it going, and that's that's what we heard actually in the Beijing meeting and uh, the ASEAN one. Uh, not so much. They they had a series of recommendations uh, that went into a document and uh, then disappeared. They, they're probably uh, filling up a filing cabinet somewhere. <laughs> It's not very, um, very promising, but it's very important to have the ASEAN thing so that that kind of person can get together and, and you know, and represent their government and talk about things in general, but uh, they're not going to come up with management um, suggestions that are actually going to be meaningful. I think it's much better um, to actually have a fisheries organization um, that meets regularly and has people that are, are worried about, you know, what can we do to actually protect this? This is one of the most complex ecological systems in the world. So a fisheries or environment person goes in there and they know that they need help. They need everybody's input. 
they need to figure out what's going on. And uh, so that's, that's what we have to emphasize as opposed to meetings, which are almost designed to just uh, make confrontation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. I think uh, your answer actually also addresses the last of the two questions that we have on our Q&A, uh, which is uh, uh, about um, how realistic could it be to pursue these initiatives if uh, China has this particular uh, perspective or attitude about history and won't back down from it. No, I think you stressed the point that that's precisely it. We need to move away from um, these kinds of sort of political positions, shall we say, uh, and really focus on the facts or the reality and the science of it. Uh, the truth is that uh, this, these political justifications and arguments will not matter if the fish stocks collapse uh, completely out of the, the because of the uh, unhindered efforts of all the countries to, to, to um, extract all of these resources. Now, um, we're, we're coming up to the end. Actually, we're, we're extending a little bit. Probably what we, it would be useful to answer the, the last of those two questions, now, which speaks to the proposal that what if uh, we involve more stakeholders at the lower level instead of just having these uh, national level uh, discussions and negotiations, would there, be, would there be room to step up discussions at subnational levels like in local governments, fisheries groups, or even private sector fishing company? Would that help or make things worse, uh, you think, no? Uh, in a way, the science uh, people has, has done a bit of this by, by getting the, the fisheries people and the ecologists, uh, the ecology people together. No? Do you think that that kind of experience, the good experience or the, the advantages from that experience could also be uh, produced by involving other uh, stakeholders? Probably uh, Amanda and, and John. Um, I, I'll defer to John on this one, but just a just a very quick plug that I, I do think that on the fisheries management side, there's a lot of potential for collective action between the scientists. Uh, and you know, one way of encouraging that is to consider the incentives that scientists and academics work under. Uh, and you know, how do you incentivize a group of disparate scientists sitting in uh, countries? in the region to work together on a piece of research um, and where can we sort of find the money really to incentivize that sort of collective research. But on the local governments, I, I defer to John. Yeah, I, I think um, it's, yeah, it kind of depends on the direction that the, that the larger picture is taking. Um, for instance, um, uh, some of the, the people who fish in uh, Scarborough, uh, they're actually coming from multiple areas, but particularly right along that coast of Luzon, uh, there, there it would make sense to uh, involve them in discussions, but um, they're not going to have much influence uh, directly on a decision, say, to protect Scarborough better. Um, they will go through the their government, which in this case is the Philippine government, and that would be um, a consideration that's brought in. So I think that the idea is not to have everybody in one table, but have um, local tables uh, talking to um, national um, people, and then the national people are, are discussing this in, uh, in the international setting. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's it's basically a good idea to get people involved in fisheries and environment together. They, the, the thing I noticed in the Beijing meeting that Amanda was coordinating um, was that the, the Chinese scientists we talked to were, were vehemently impassioned about finding out where the tuna are coming from that come into their sector and were very happy that somebody from Vietnam was there who studies the tuna. They were worried about sea turtles. They were worried about uh, duongs. Um, you know, there was a number of concerns and th they, they can't individually figure out what's going on just by one country. This is why, this is the, the nature of fisheries in enclosed, semi-enclosed areas. This is why it's built into uh, the United Nations law of the sea, 
that if you have a sending close thing, you must coordinate. It, we, we have not only the tuna and the mackerel moving back and forth across the place, but we have genetic flow. We have larvae scattered across the whole of the South China Sea from coral reef fish to, uh, to pelagic fish. And the, the fish that swim like uh, long distances like tuna and mackerel, they feed on coral reefs. So the whole thing is one ecosystem. And the only way to really figure out what's going on is to look at all of these countries, uh, getting, getting their information together. But I think that the, the approach of the University of British Columbia um, uh, is the right one to reconstruct the, the catch and to do that maybe periodically. We can make estimates. We have enough 150 years of fisheries science. We can make estimates of the situation from small amounts of information as long as we have that IUU information that you get from catch reconstruction. So that's, that's what has to happen as far as getting the data. But uh, we have to keep the discussions up uh, in the friendly sector <laughs> that would keep uh, things uh, more likely to stay peaceful. Yes. yes. Thank you, John. I think the underlining message there is that in the end, we're all interconnected. So we really have to help each other in the end uh, if you want to really uh, address this. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have run over time. It's really been a very interesting discussion. I would like to thank everyone who uh, attended the conference. No, I'd like to thank also the our guys at the CSIS uh, AV uh, what officer section who've been who've been staying up all uh, night in these past three weeks. Thank you for all the help and assistance. Uh, um, um, and it's been a very good uh, experience. It's it's a it's a wonderful thing to be cooperating. Uh, through this, uh, despite the pandemic and the restrictions, we can still work together. Uh, I hope that we can continue to do this uh, in the future. Although, of course, I would prefer in-person meetings, more in-person meetings by that point. So, Greg, I'll turn it over to you for closing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. We're, we're already over, and it's been, you know, three very full um, and robust sessions. So, I'll just close by saying thank you to UP for partnering with us. Thank you to the U.S. Embassy. For making this possible. I really wish we had been able to do it in person in Manila last year like we planned. Um, you know, maybe the embassy will foot the bill for us to do it in person next year. You know, we'll see. But for now, thank you to everybody who joined. Thanks to Amanda John. And uh, the videos will be up on YouTube. So share it widely and get the word out. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.